All right, everyone, it's John again from FMS. I'm really excited today because we have with us uh, Porter Stansberry, who um, for most of you who've been in the industry, Porter, it doesn't need an introduction, but for those of you who may be a little bit new to the industry, um, Porter is the only person I know who, I think he took what, um, did you have like 36K and a laptop and basically grew it to a $3 billion value. Uh, well, overnight success, 22, year, 22 years yeah. later. <laughs> um, but also I think like, um, and just for everyone, like, Porter's, he's coming to FMS. He's going to be talking about how he's managed to build a business that has, what, 3X, the lifetime value of a customer compared to pretty much everyone else in the industry. Um, but when we were talking, I realized, like, I have a whole lot of questions about a lot of things besides simply the publishing side. And so we decided to do this, um, have this conversation, which is, you know, I think everybody's been following other people in the industry. And I think of you as the person that most people actually have followed and then other people are following them in terms of what they, they've done in the business. Like I remember when I came in the business, I'm, Stansberry Research was, I think the largest Agora group at the time. Um, and everyone was following what you guys were doing. Um, and then even over the years, as other groups put up you know, larger gross numbers, you guys were still taking home more actual money than everybody else. And so, um, you like uh i was talking to a friend named pete monson who's a financial copywriter he's worked around you know for quite a while in the industry and he was saying you know it always seems like porter's been working from a different roadmap than any, everyone else and i was like that seemed really appropriate not just on the publishing side but on the business side um and so porter that's that's kind of what we wanted to talk about today is the business decisions you've made from the beginning that are kind of pivotal in building a company from startup to a three billion dollar um ipo and like, you would know better than I where that would start. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's interesting that, that they thought I was on a different roadmap because I really was. My my original business partner and I, his name is Steve Sugarood, and he wrote the True Wealth newsletter for many years, still does. And he and I looked at the the newsletter business back in the in mid 1990s, so 95 and 96. And at the time, Steve was running a global mutual fund and I was just getting out of college. So I really, I had, I, I knew nothing about the financial newsletters or about the financial publishing industry as opposed to investment banks and brokerage firms. And Steve basically said, look, there's two ways of doing business. You can, you can be regulated and be a broker, or you can be unregulated and be a newsletter writer. And you know, being a newsletter writer is way more scalable. You don't have to deal with clients one-on-one. -on -one. You don't have to be a fiduciary. If you have good investment ideas and you, you can write, then you can be successful as a, as a newsletter writer and not just as an individual broker. And I didn't really, I didn't really care. I just wanted to be involved in finance. I loved the challenge of capital allocation. I loved the, the research process. I love the incredible differences in business models. And I still do. You know, the reason why McDonald's has been a great investment for 40 years isn't because their food is any good. It's not. It's because they are a royalty business, right? They don't even really own restaurants. Yes, technically they own, they own, they own maybe 25% of their locations, but their whole business is, is getting people to buy franchises and they get seven cents on the dollar every time you buy a Coke. That's a hell of a business. I mean, they're a marketer and a brander. They're not really a restaurateur. And so... If you understand that, then you're way more likely to invest in McDonald's and you would have done very well if you had. But my point is just that so much in finance isn't what it looks to be from the outside. And that was always my fascination. And that's what I wanted to be involved in. And I didn't really care whether it was as an analyst at a hedge fund or writing a newsletter. And I don't know that that is very true. I don't know if that passion for finance is the same thing and a lot of the online marketers and copywriters that I have met. I think they're more interested in marketing and they're more interested in advertising than I was. And I think if you actually read the, the copy that I have written and you, and you look at the different things I've done on the front end and the back end, the one thing that unites them all is that they're all poorly written. I'm, I'm, I'm complete hack. Uh, and then, but the financial ideas are very deep. And I, I just thought if we could have better ideas, we would probably win. And so that's what we tried to do. And I don't think that was the same as a lot of other publishers. The other thing that I think that really set us apart was I figured out really early on that there was a quantum difference between a really good financial writer and the average financial writer. And when I say really good, 
I'm talking about a guy like, for example, David Lashmet. I hired him out of the University of Florida. He was a, a medical researcher at Florida. He studied the history of virology, <laughs> which is a, a really niche space. But he, uh, you know, you know, he's kind of like a Mensa member kind of mind. He's extremely smart, and he's done a lot of he's done a lot of bench science in his time. And for the last 20 years, I've paid him to go to every meta, every major medical conference and get to know every important scientist and read every important paper. So when he writes a, a report about a biotech new product, it's written at a level and at a, with a density that nobody else can compete with in the financial newsletter space. There, there isn't another person like that in the world, much less in financial newsletters. Well, to keep him, I had to pay him a bloody fortune because he could go to work at any hedge fund. He could go to work at any investment bank tomorrow. But he wants the freedom and the, you know, he likes to, he likes to be his own boss. So it's a good relationship that we have, but I had to be able to pay him a lot or I wouldn't have been able to get him or keep him. And that was really tough because most financial publishers, frankly, they pay people peanuts. And as a result, they end up with a lot of monkeys on their staff. And if you're going to write about something as complex as modern biotech, you really have to know what you're doing or you're just selling schlock. And if you're selling schlock, that becomes really apparent really quickly. And you can't, you can't get the prices for the products that we had. So my model was, yeah, I got to pay a guy like David Lashmet five times or 10 times more than most people in this industry make for being a financial newsletter writer. But in the marketplace, he's worth a hundred times more. And so I was, I always thought that was the bigger, fatter margin. And that would lead to the larger lifetime values and the higher prices for products. You know, so we're able to sell our lifetime product now uh, for $35,000, which, you know, when we started into this, th that was just completely implausible. No one ever thought, no one ever thought that would be possible. Right. But we, I knew that if we had enough talent and if the content was actually worth it, we could get the price and we did. And so that's what I've always tried to do. Go out. If you're going to have a product, go find the guy who's the best in the world at it, recruit him, and then build the business. And so for a guy with like, for example, with Empire Financial, I wanted Whitney Tilson. Whitney Tilson had started writing about stocks in the 1990s. He had a very successful hedge fund. He's been on 60 Minutes three times. Like he is credibility. And when he got out of his hedge fund business, the two places he was likely to go work were, were either Stansberry or Motley Fool. And so I'd been recruiting him since 2003, 2004. And I'd sent him lots of, you know, good information on stocks. I'd helped him, it helped him with his hedge fund. So he knew me and he was willing to come over and we started in 2017. And that business now, Empire is probably worth a hundred million dollars now. Um, and so those, those timelines and those recruiting, it takes a long time, takes a lot of capital, but it does work. And, and so that's just what we did. We, we didn't, we didn't launch products until we had the right analyst. And we insisted on having somebody that we could completely and, and fully believe in. So let me parse that out a little bit, because I feel like when, when, when you, we say things like the quality of the product and the editor, and you, and you talk about passion about financial markets, like a lot of people in our space gloss that over. They just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have that. Like, or I have a guy who he, you know, he has this minor level of experience often, um, or in some cases, there are people who never had any experience and they were just going to kind of just figure stuff out as they go because they figure they need somebody to fill a, a product hole. Um, the, the focus on like quality of editor and actually putting somebody who's actually went out there on the ground and involved in the industry that they're in, like, I feel like that is completely overlooked almost across the board by most people. Um, a lot of publishers will take somebody who's like, well, they used to, they used to be this, they used to be at a hedge fund. Um, and now they want to write, but now they're not really involved in the markets anymore. They're not going to conferences or not like, they're not out there like actively, like it's not, it's not like a living business for them. It's like, you know, I have some experience. I'm going to write about what I did, you know, 30 years ago. Um, and you know, when, when I find something on Yahoo finance, I'm going to write up, write it up. Um, that, but that quality and that, like, that active pursuit of quality, I think, so you have, a, you have somebody, um, who's really amazing at understanding a sector, but you're, you're talking about putting them on the ground continually over and over again throughout the business. They're not just like, I was really good before and now I sit at home, don't do anything but write. Um, 
You know, it just depends. You can definitely do well with a guy who was a senior person and is now, you know, partially retired. But I would just tell you as a publisher, uh, you you know, your most important employee is not your head of marketing or your head copywriter. Your most important uh, employee is the managing editor. And if the managing editor has the budget and the mandate and the chops to do a great job, you can definitely build great products. And the first question the managing editor should ask every editor when he's assigning a, a, a you know a, a, a monthly newsletter or any kind of project is, you know who who are you going to speak to about this, mm-hmm. you know? And if you're not going to do five or six interviews, then don't bother taking the assignment. And I think that's one of the biggest things that most people getting into the business really screw up is, man, if I talk to two people, just two people, and I have two 20 minute phone calls with two people who are in the industry and who really know what's going on, that saves me a hundred hours of online research. And sure, I've got to go read the 10K, I've got to read the 10Q. Obviously, I have to do that before I can have those interviews. But the, the, the context that comes with those discussions is irreplaceable and you can't find it online. So if you are getting started and you don't have a pedigree and you don't know where to go to get somebody who does, and you don't, you know, you can't afford to spend a million dollars a year on an editor, then you just got to get really good at working the phones. And that goes for copywriters too. If you're writing copy about an investment trend, how many people did you talk to about the copy? And if the answer is less than 10, you haven't done your job. And your copy is going to suck compared to somebody who's made those phone calls and has all those little actualities, those little, those little, you know, family stories, the, all the stuff that, that really adds the textual credibility that makes it believable and makes it really memorable. And if you don't have that stuff, then you haven't done a good job writing. And let me just say one more thing about this. The more people that you talk to, the more you're going to learn and the more you're going to know. And one of the most important things that Stansbury Research ever did was identify in 2009 that the Eagle Ford and the Permian Basin and the Marcellus Shale, among others, were gonna transform the oil industry globally. And that was a time when most publishers were still selling peak oil, running out of oil, the other publishers said. Meanwhile, Stansbury Research was saying, we're gonna go from producing 5 million barrels of oil in the United States out of all sources to producing 15 million barrels a day just in Texas. And that's gonna happen in the next 10 years. And of course it has. And the, the changes that that has brought to our economy and to that industry are, are incomparable. And so we would have never known about that. That wasn't on the internet, you know? What was right. on the internet was peak oil. But of course we had, we had deep industry contacts. We had a professional geologist who had spent 10 years in the industry working for us. And believe it or not, my best contact in Texas is a guy named Cactus Schroeder, whose family has been in the oil business for, you know, for, for three generations. And he literally knows every single person in, in Dallas and it's in the oil business. And so you go, you don't make those contacts. You don't get that kind of information unless you're out there talking to people. And you, you're not going to be able to talk to people if you don't have products that are good and respectable. Mm-hmm. And so that's just it all. It's, it's, it's not, a, it's not one thing you do. It's a, it's a constant evolution and a constant improvement. And unless you have that dedication to the editorial, it's going to be very difficult for you to get good prices for your products. Cause frankly, they're not worth anything. Yeah. I think that's again, like, like it's so, it's so nice to hear you say that just because it, the, most people in our space could name a copywriter from a different, from a bunch of different businesses. They couldn't ma- name the managing editor or even in often cases, the, the, the editors themselves, um, the marketers and the copywriters are kind of the, the, the ones who everyone looks to, because like you said, everyone's obsessed with that part of the business. Um, when, when you look at the, the talent side of this, um, one of the things that I think that you've done better than most other groups is retain talent. Um, and that's editorial talent, but that is also your marketing and other people that you kind of stars that you, you have, um, on the team. So like, what have you done differently in that space? Like how do, how do you, whether it was the, the recruiting piece, like you said, these long-term relationships, like that speaks to me personally, because I, I, I see this with myself, that there are just relationships that it takes years. You know, this is a good person. You have a good dynamic. Um, this is a star, like over the course of several years, maybe you keep trying to do things where it's just the timing's not right, but then eventually the time hits and, and you, you can work together. Um, yeah. but and, what else and, have you, you know, done? 
you know, superstars, superstars don't jump ship. You know, they're, they're very hard to recruit, but they stick around. So I started recruiting Michael Palmer in 1996. <laughs> in 1996, he finally came to work for me in 2002. And when he came to work for me at the end of 2002, he told me, Porter, I'm only going to work for you for a year. I really like being freelance and I'm a good copywriter and I can work for all publishers. I don't have to work just for you. And I said, Mike, if you give me a year, I'll be flattered. And of course, you know, whatever you want to do. And then it was really simple. It wasn't just pay. Of course, I paid him more than anybody else would. That's fine. But it wasn't just pay. It was, I gave him more tools and ammunition to get the job done. So man, it's a lot easier to be a copywriter when you actually have really good editors to work with, with really good ideas. And when the editors are all pulling together as a team. So Mike doesn't have to write the whole package. He just has to write the headline and the lead. And then he's going to have two or three assistant people who help him with the body copy and the editors are handling all the premiums and we work together as a team and everybody gets paid as a team. You know, it's interesting to me that the industry figured out real quickly how to pay people as a team to do something like a webinar because it takes a lot of coordination, the editors, the marketers, the technical staff and the copywriters. People still haven't figured out how to do that on the front end packages. Well, we write front end packages in two weeks. And the only way that two happens weeks. in two weeks. And the only way that happens if you have a good copywriter and you have good editors and you have good assistant editors and you have good lawyers. And of course it also helps when you're actually writing stuff that's real and meaningful and novel, you know, it's not, it's not, um, anyways, but my whole point is if you want to attract, if you're, if you're trying to attract the Yankees, you know, you, you, you can't have a triple a dugout. You, you got to have an, a bunch of other stars for the Yankees to work with. And so, the compensation structure is a big part of it, of course, but man, people like to work with the best. And so among the things that I did that was different was, um, when I realized, so this is a concept I call, I call, I call it gravity. And here's the thing. If you get three or four superstars together, working together, what they can accomplish is, is unparalleled. You, you can't do it with just one star. You got to have a group and that group creates this gravity that attracts everybody else. So you're gonna get the best marketers, you're gonna get the best customer service people, you're gonna get the best sales people because they wanna work with Steve Sugar, Mike Palmer and David Lashman and I've got them. And then an interesting thing happens. If you start letting C players into the universe, you'll lose your A players. Hmm. The company culture will change. Now, I probably shouldn't tell this story because I probably violated some employment rule, but I walked into my office, this is a long time ago, this is 10, 10 years ago, roughly. I walked into my office one day, actually more than 10 years ago, and I just didn't like the people I saw walking down the halls. You know, we, are, we were probably at 100 employees, maybe 120 employees by that point. And when I say I didn't like the people walking down my halls, I wouldn't have wanted to be friends with them. If I had gotten stuck at an airport with them for five hours, I would have been miserable because they didn't have anything interesting to say. They weren't the kind of people who read books, they were the kind of people that watched television. They just weren't for us. They shouldn't have been working in a research organization. They shouldn't be involved in creative activities because they were, they were duds. And one of these duds, this is a true story. I don't want to say if there's a man or a woman because it doesn't matter, but, but they built um, basically a bunker of canned food on their desk. So they had like a bunch of Chef Boyardee cans of food around their, their workspace. And let's just say they weren't in the best physical condition. And I was like, man, nobody wants to come in and watch an obese person eat Chef Boyer OD out of a can at their desk. This is just not, this is not helping our recruiting or our culture. And so I figured out, this is a true story. I figured out that there was one person in our organization who had hired 12 or 14 duds. And I was like, ah, that's the cancer that needs to be cut out. And so I had him and all 14 people come to a meeting. And I fired all of them in one meeting <laughs> and you know, they, they all had, you know, a nice check in front of them. I said, all you got to do is sign a piece of paper that says we can be friends and I won't disparage you and you won't disparage me. And we can all go on our way and have a new start. And you guys definitely need a new start because you're not going to succeed here. This isn't the right environment for you. And so they are all shocked and chagrined and, you know, signed their checks and we're you know, getting ready to leave. And uh, guy knocks on the door of the meeting and opens the door and goes, Porter, hi, nice to meet you. I'm, I'm Joe Smith. I'm new here. Today's my first day. 
And everyone in my group got called into this meeting and I thought maybe you wanted me here too, but you just didn't know to invite me because it's my first day. And I was like, Joe, who hired you? And he pointed <laughs> to, the, to the guy who was the source of all these problems. And I said, oh yeah, definitely, come on in. <laughs> You're fired. <laughs> and, oh, the poor guy. Uh, oh. But oh, you know, this, this person, this person was hiring people who just didn't measure up. He just, he wasn't gonna work in our group. And what you needed to, what you needed to be successful in our group was you had to have a relatively quick mind. So I told people at a meeting recently that if you didn't make a 1400 on the SAT, I wasn't going to hire you. Now, I don't mean that literally, you know, if you, if you got a perfect score in the English and you weren't that good at math, you'd probably be fine or vice versa. But like, you got to have a really, a, you got to have a passion for intellectual growth and for intellectual challenge, or you're not going to get along with any of your peers. So hiring really smart people was sort of the number one thing. And then the number two thing was, I really liked it if you had a background in competitive team sports. So if you were a college lacrosse player, or you were a college football player, or you were a, a, a woman's soccer player, or, you know, I didn't really care what your passion was, but it was way more fun to be around people who were passionate about their, about their lives, you know, not just their careers. And I just, I wanted to be inspired by the people that I was working with. I didn't want to have to do all the inspiration myself. And that was, that was a big, that was a definitely a big difference. We were a very, very competitive bunch. That's fascinating. I remember when I first came into copywriting years ago and I don't, I haven't written copy in years because we kind of moved with the conference into other businesses. Um, but there was a list that I got from um, Clayton Makepeace when I worked with him uh, from you, actually, it was a list of books that every copywriter should read. And a hundred percent of them were finance books. They were not like, Gene Schwartz or copywriting books. It was like, no, intelligent investor. It was um, like you had to actually understand financial concepts and history in the market to, to be able to write in that space. And um, since then, I've seen nobody say or do anything that suggests that they think that that's the case, at least not in recent years. Um, and that, that to me, um, I guess, speaks to me about the culture you're kind of talking about. You have the an actual mind for the industry, you have a passion for, for markets, like, cause finance, like when you, when you look at it, it's one of the most fascinating areas in the world because, or subjects in the world, cause one is so broad, it intersects with business, politics, um, you know, there's the economy, there's, there's investing, there's skill, there's all these different things. It's like this fascinating kind of central hub of how the world works. And so if someone's not passionate about that, it seems like they probably shouldn't be writing for products in that space. Um, yeah, I agree with you. I also just think that, I mean, I was just shocked at the, at the really poor level of basic financial knowledge amongst um, virtually all the marketers or copywriters that I met in the industry when I got into it. It was just shocking to me that they didn't, that truly, they didn't know the difference between a penny stock and an actual business. They didn't know the difference. And I, I mean, I was just blown away by that. I, I mean, I just blown away. I mean, I remember... This is a true story. I remember a publisher at Agora was writing a penny stock package and he was claiming that stocks like Intel were penny stocks because he was looking at historical prices and he didn't understand the impact of stock splits going backwards. So, you know, there was never a time that Intel actually traded for 13 cents. <laughs> That's not the actual nominal price. That's the current price after, you know, a dozen stock splits in reverse. And he had no idea of that. And as a result, his work was just embarrassing. I mean, it was nonsensical. Of course, it still worked in the mail, you know, because the people he's writing to didn't know any better either. Right. But I would have just been embarrassed to be associated with that kind of a publication. I mean, that's just bad. Right. <laughs> and so if you're, you know, if you're a marketer or a copywriter and you say, I don't care what the damn editorial says, it just matters that the response rate is. Well, look, that's certainly one way of doing business. And I, I, I'm not going to be overly critical of it. It just wasn't for me. And I don't think that you can be very successful doing that for long because you might start just by shining on your clients. But eventually, if that's your mindset, you end up shining yourself on too. And yeah. uh, that, that leads to a catastrophe. Yeah, and it's going to have an it's going to have knock on effects with 
recruiting talent later who knows what's going on with um, partnership potential with regulators with all kinds yeah. of people um, absolutely in that business by the way it collapsed spectacularly you know about 18 months later and caused them a lot of pro a lot of problems so it's just it's just i don't know how you know it's a very competitive space and i don't know what you're thinking if you if you think you're going to be really successful and you and you don't and you haven't even read those books and i remember that list there's probably 20 books on the list and like that's the stuff that every first year finance student would have read like it's not that wasn't those those things were easy to read we're not talking about the black shoals theory of options pricing or right. <laughs> something something that's pretty complicated you know or i'm just saying like uh it, it really it's like, think about it, if you're trying to open a restaurant, you didn't know how to cook an egg. Like, you, you know, you're the owner of the restaurant, you may not be the person cooking eggs, but you sure as hell better know how they're cooked. Yeah. Or how can you... Basic level of knowledge that's needed. Yeah. So that's always, that's always struck me as, 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 as interesting. But yeah, I, I, uh, I do think that it really does make sense. And, and I think that it'll be worth your time if you're a marketer, a publisher, or a copywriter to spend a good part of your day trying to really understand what's going on in the financial markets. Mm -hmm. It's the only way you have a good opportunity to understand when something new and important is happening, whether that's the emergence of crypto or a big change in the oil industry or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Now there, there's a, there's a rumor legend maybe that when you first started coming into the industry, there was somebody who fired you and said that you would never be successful as a newsletter publisher. Is that true? That's very true. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't want to use his name because I don't want any more litigation no, no, in my but... life. But there was a, there was a very senior publisher at Agora, the most senior publisher at Agora at the time. And he and I had a very terrible personality uh, conflict in part because I'm not a very good employee. You know, I don't, I didn't mind in a meeting telling him flat out that he was dead wrong about about anything. And I figured as long as I was right, then I was, then I would be okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> if you embarrass your boss repeatedly in meetings, you will get fired. And uh, I certainly was fired. I was fired the first week in January, 1999. And uh, he told me when he fired me that I was the least entrepreneurial person he'd ever met. And that I was sure to be a failure. And uh, I thought that was a little gratuitous. Um, <laughs> But, you know, one of us went on to become a billionaire publisher and one of us was out of the industry and in, a couple of years later. Fair enough. I think that says it. Um, so you started with kind of the, the full Agora mothership behind you. And then over the years, you've moved Stansberry and then Legacy and the other business units um, that became market-wise away from um, kind of the, the, the Agora mothership Um why did you decide to do that? And what was the impact of that? Um, Cause it seems to me that you, you started with one business that was tied to Agora. And then as you moved away, you ended up building your own ecosystem of companies um, that became, you know, more substantial now, I think, or close to as substantial as um, the Agora ecosystem itself. Yeah. Well, that's a very interesting story. And I don't think that I've ever told it publicly anywhere. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't have any reason not to, but, we just, we don't normally talk about the things the way, you know, we don't want to talk about things that are structured, but I'm happy to. Um, but what really happened was because I had been fired from Agora, when I wrote uh, what we call the railroad package, which was the first direct mail package I ever wrote. And the headline- new Railroad Across America. Well, there's a new railroad across America that's making some people very rich, um, and me included. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't say that, but um, it did, you know, there was the railroad package and it was a story that talked about the historical significance of the new fiber optic networks and the way that they would change the world and commerce the way that railroads had. And it was a new way of understanding um, this technological boom that really helped people who were older and who weren't familiar with computers get why it was important. It's hard to believe this, but back in 1999, there was an argument being made that none of this, that this, that the internet was just a fad and it wouldn't, you know, it was no more important than a fax machine. And so, you know, explaining why that wasn't exactly the case was important and the package really caught traction. And, um, you know, at the time it was the best selling thing that had ever happened in the financial newsletter space. We made, um, this is back when you had to pay for stamps and postage and printing. We still made 800% ROI on, the, on, on, the, on, that, on those mailings. I mean, we were, and we were mailing the phone book. It was an amazing takeoff. Well, the interesting thing was I did all that before I was at Agora. 
I did all that from my kitchen table. And so I sent that package to Bill Bonner, who is the, is the principal at Agora. And I said, hey, I think this will work. And you've always been really good to me, and he has been. And it's not your fault that this other guy fired me. Um, and if you want this package, I'll sell it to you for 50 grand, which I thought was, you know, would have been the highest price that I'd ever seen him pay for a package. And I didn't think it was likely that Bill would pay me, but I thought it'd be a good place to start the negotiation. And I said, I'll give you 24 hours on it exclusively, but if you don't buy it from me, then I'm going to send it to your biggest competitor, which at the time was Phillips Publishing. And I, I had no, I knew Tom Phillips from, from social connections. And so I kind of put Bill in a little bit of a bind there. And he said, well, I don't know about the price, but I'll definitely buy it from you. Let's talk with some people and figure out a way to get you back into the fold. And, you know, we'll just trust me, we'll work something out. And I did trust him because he's Bill is the most honorable person I've ever met in my life. In fact, we, we ran Stansberry Holdings, which became MarketWise, from 2014 until 2019 on a handshake. We didn't have a contract of any kind or an operating agreement. Wow. Yeah. And the, wow. by that point, it was a, you know, $300, $400 million a year in sales business. But dealing with Bill is no problem because he completely is good for his word. And so he said, hey, we'll work something out. And I was like, okay. And so it ended up, he never, he never uh, paid me for the package in cash. Instead, he agreed to finance the marketing of it, which he did to the tune of 36 grand. And then, so, so we had sold, we had sold the public Porter Stansberry's investment advisory, but Bill didn't have a contract with Porter Stansberry and didn't really even own the package because <laughs> he had never bought the, the copyright from me. And so we, we, struck a, we struck a deal where I was going to get 25% of the equity um, of the business and he was going to put up all the money and a lot of the back end stuff. You know, I didn't have, I didn't have a legal department, obviously. I didn't have customer service. I didn't, mm -hmm. So I thought that was a really good deal for me. And, it, and I think at the time it was a really good deal. And we went forward. But of course, we never papered anything. We just had an agreement. And so um, over time, that agreement changed and... Um, Bill gave up more and more of the equity to different employees as I, as I kind of demanded. And, um, and then, in, so what happened was then in 2014, really we needed to, we had gotten to a size where we just had to paper everything. And so we, we, we moved completely off of Agora systems and we set up a whole different, we recapitalized and set up a whole different legal structure to own the, the companies. And we gave all the, uh, all the employees real equity, but it took us five years to get all that work done because we were so far behind the eight ball and papering everything. Um, and so that, that, that schism in 2014 was, was in part a legal matter, but it was also in part a, a cultural and structural matter. We had really, what, what Stansbury Holdings was doing was really different than what Agora was doing at the time. And Agora more and more copied our model but we were really focused on lifetime value. And we, we, we innovated this thing called the Alliance Offer, which is where you pay a certain price and you get all of our products, including all the products we, we build in the future. And, and we really pioneered that whole model because I, I just figured lifetime value was the, the thing to keep investing in, not just more marketing. And that really worked well for us. And, and that really influences the culture of the company too, because everyone in the organization understands that what's important is not just the next new promo, but instead the fulfillment process, the renewal process, the upselling process, and you know, the onboarding and, and everything else that goes along with it. And frankly, Agora a lot of times was an impediment to that process um, because we were treating customers sort of differently than a lot of their brands were. And we were, but we still shared some database stuff. So like their customer number would be the same at Stansbury Research as it was at say Agora Financial. And that was really confusing and hard to explain. Right. So by really separating everything completely, um, it was helpful for us in building out our own real unique brand and um, style. That makes sense. That's great. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, the So as you did start to bring on different business units, then um, I know at some point, and I'm not sure exactly what year that was, you brought Mark in. Um, I met him when he was, I think he was the head of biz dev at the time. And then he became the eventual CEO. And, and you described to me in the previous conversation that, you know, he's kind of the outside CEO and you're kind of the inside CEO. Um, could you kind of, like, what's that dynamic work and why did you kind of evolve into that model? Yeah, um, just to be clear, I'm, I'm no longer at market-wise. Right. So I'm, 
I'm no longer the outside CEO. I, re I resigned and retired in December of 2020. Um, and now Mark Arnold is, the is both the chairman and the CEO. But the way, the way I kind of saw uh, Mark's role was, for, you're exactly right, he started out uh, helping us um, roll up some, some of the companies that we liked in the industry and improving their operations. And those, th those M&A processes were unbelievable home runs. So if you have a good list and if you have a good lifetime relationship with your customers, you can introduce them to lots of new products and they'll keep buying. And that's what really drove those M&A processes. So we had Mark doing that. And, and as a result, he just, he was just sort of working a lot more outside the business, meaning he was going out to the, the conferences to meet other publishers. He was, he was more involved in that outside process. He was also just his background as a deal lawyer uh, for a, a venture capital law firm. That's just what he understood that, that, that part of the business and structuring things. Meanwhile, sort of my job was to teach the new, the new people who are joining our company about our culture and about our writing techniques and about, you know, what we wanted to see editorially and in our copy. And sometimes it meant introducing people to direct response for the very first time, because some of the companies we bought um, had never done that kind of marketing before. So in some cases I had to get people to be more aggressive and it's some people, in some cases I had to get people to be less aggressive. It just kind of was just, I was just spent a lot of time talking to people about what our style and tone was and what we wanted to see and, and way we thought that we could make the businesses work better. And so that's just how, that's just how it functioned. I just kept my hands in the content and Mark basically handled the, the, the business and the deal making side of things. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my title was chairman and his was CEO, but really we ran the company together. In fact, I'll tell you something very interesting about Stansbury Holdings. We were a, pri we were a, a private company and we had, as a private company, we had a board um, and we had five members on the board. Two of them were from Agora, two of them were from Stansbury Holdings and I was the chairman in the tie breaking vote. So I had a central control of the business. But the interesting thing was, is we always agreed informally that we would never do anything that was significant or material without everyone's approval. So anytime we did an acquisition, anytime we established some new pay structure or anything important, we all had to agree that it was a good idea. And for a long time, that was very frustrating to some folks who wanted us to be able to change faster or do more or whatever their, you know, whatever their little pet project was. But I actually think that was a fantastic idea. It kept us from doing things too fast. And in and, and many cases, it saved us a ton of heartache and a lot of trouble. Hmm. And so if you're involved in a private business that gets to any size or gets to any scale, and you can do that informally, if you have that, hopefully you have that kind of relationship with your other owners, your other partners, um, I really think that works the best. So that the, whatever you're going to do an acquisition or buying a new building, whatever it is, whatever's, you know, big mm -hmm. decision, Everyone's got to agree it's the right decision. Wow. So when you look back, though, like on building this business, what do you think? So I know we're going to set the lifetime value discussion aside because you're really going to focus out in depth at FMS and, you know, we've gone through several things. What do you think were the, like, if you had to name like the three to five most pivotal kind of decisions you've made, what would you be in your top three? Like, um, Definitely, you know, I think the most important decision was how we decided to treat our employees. You know, I just, I just knew that I wasn't going to get anywhere in business without a lot of help. And so when I recruited Mike Palmer, one of the things I did that I think most people will think was a little kind of crazy is I said, Hey, listen, I'm probably going to end up writing a lot of the copy with you and I don't want this to ever be a problem. So I'm never going to take a royalty. And most copywriters would be like, "Woo, you give up a lot of income. <laughs> yeah, I did. And then, you know, I had, I had, I had deals with my partners that I would get management bonuses based on the net income of the total group. And I just knew that that was great for me, but it wasn't going to lead to growth for the business. So I, over time, I gave up all those bonuses in order to recruit other people and to, and to make sure that the company was successful. And, uh, you know, so at, at, when I left, um, I don't know if this is still the case or not, but when I left the company, 10% of the net income every year went directly to employees and bonuses. Wow. And that's a very large amount of money. That's so fascinating because I've heard other people from other large publishers like who didn't have um, any type of real stake 
than anything who ended up leaving over time. Um, and um, I know in one case in particular, there was a, you know, kind of an argument was actually, you guys were used as an example of like, look, 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 look what Porter did for Palmer and these other guys. And um, like, why would you do the same for your, the team that helped build this company? And the response was, uh, you know, you're making enough money, it's fine. Yeah, well, I think it's just a different philosophy. Just a very different philosophy. I, I knew that I wouldn't be able to get rich uh, unless a lot of other people got got rich too. And oh, that's fascinating. So, just yeah, so, just I have. I, so one thing was just the way the way that I the way that I thought of employees and the way that I wanted partners. Um, and then, secondly, you know, it seems obvious, but we just always put the customer first. And I know that sounds really obvious, but we really, truly put the customer first. So like in every way, anytime there was an issue, we would just make sure the customer won. So like, if you're gonna roll a product, what should you give them instead? Give them whatever they want. What if it costs more? Doesn't make any difference. Give them whatever they want. Um, you know, are we gonna own stocks? Are we gonna trade stocks while we're writing about them? Hell no, why not? Well, because we wanna put the customer first. Well, that means we're not gonna make as much money. So be it. Like, we're not gonna do that. I can't manage all those conflicts and it just doesn't make sense to the customer. So don't do it. Um, you know, are we gonna invest in a lot of customer service people? Are they gonna be college educated? Are we gonna put them in our building? Are we gonna treat them like actual coworkers? Yeah, we are. Why? Because that's what's best for the customer. Oh, we're gonna spend a fortune on it. Yeah, but that's an investment in the customer. We'll get the money back. So, you know, really, really treating um, your employees really well and generously and then treating them. And then of course, doing everything you can to treat, the, to put the customer first. And then I guess the other, the other thing is gonna sound again, kind of obvious in retrospect, but wasn't at the time at all. It's just, I always shied away from doing anything at a, at a very low cost. You know, if you, if you discount your products, you're going to get a lower quality customer. And I didn't, it's not that I, it's not that I don't think that those businesses can work well. I just always thought, you know, that I bet, I bet Louis Vuitton makes a lot more money than Kmart. Not sure if that's the case, but I bet they do. And I definitely want to be in the Louis Vuitton business, not the Kmart business, because the Kmart business is just a shit show and I don't want to be a part of it. So we just, we just tried to price our products very aggressively, even though the marketers would tell me all the time, you're going to have more subscribers if you price it less. And I'm kind of like, well, maybe, but they're going to be the wrong kind of subscribers. And what and the business I want to be in is a lifetime value business, not in the, not in running the marketing um, hamster trail business. Right. You kind of get, you get the customers you ask for. Um, yeah. And you're going to get the kind of, you're going to get the employees that you ask for too. And so those are just the sort of the two things that I really think made a big difference. It allowed us to get good people, keep good people, both as employees and customers. That makes a lot of sense. It seems like I know we, with internet marketing and financial marketing and digital, like copyright and all of it, the, there's a, it's an easy thing for a lot of entrepreneurs to get distracted with what's the new marketing thing. And it's a constant thing. And what strikes me about what you guys have done is really like this mastering and focus on fundamentals um, first, which is something that's so ignored, I feel like across the board. Blocking and, it, blocking and tackling. Yeah. 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 Um, it's hard. It's awfully hard to be at a football team who's, who's got the best line, you know, and can get four yards of carry. <laughs> they, they win a lot of football games. It might not look great, but they usually win. Fair enough. Um, so, the, I want to move a little bit to your decision on why you decided to do the SPAC, why you decided to go public. Um, I, think, I feel like I've heard rumors about that, like, desire to go public for years before you guys did it. Um, I don't know if that's just me misremembering or not, but um, it seems like it was something that you really focused on, obviously, and then when you did it, um, it was, you know, we. it's almost like a watershed moment in the industry, um, and I think... Uh, it, it made a huge splash, obviously. Um, why did you decide to do that? Um, and, you know, what's your experience with that? Would you do it again? Um, yeah, well, you know, I told you that from the beginning, Steve and I are really fascinated with finance. And, and his experience as a money manager and a broker had taught him that a lot of the regulation 
is actually bad for the customer. It's nonsensical. And so we thought that by getting into this unregulated space, we could build a better product that would be better for the customer. And I'm convinced it is. If you look at the track record of any of our model portfolios, they're world-class. And instead of having to pay us a percent or two of your assets, you paid a one-time fee. And you know, maybe three or four years ago, a lot of brokers started doing the same thing. They said, look, if you wanna just pay us $1,000 a year, you can. I mean, I don't know exactly what the pricing was, but I know they started offering flat fee financial services. And that was my question. Why in the world do I have to pay a percentage of my assets to use your service? When I go to the hotel, they don't say, Mr. Stansberry, how much money is in your wallet or your, your luggage? Give us a percent of that, you stay at our hotel. No, they say our hotel costs X. Okay, so why, why would you buy financial services in, a, in this other bizarro way? Didn't make any sense. The other thing that I always resented was that the, the, the wealth management industry always claims that they're gonna make their clients wealthier. Trust me, that's not the way it works. The wealth management industry exists by siphoning wealth from their clients into their own pockets. And I liked being able to write about that and liked having a business model that was the opposite of that. It just, I just think it's more ethical and certainly more fun. And so the main reason why we wanted to go public was because we think, and this is still true, that there is room for us to compete with every financial service provider, not just other publishers. And so we've designed our products and we've hired the right people to do things that other, you know, that other wealth management companies do from a fiduciary standpoint that we think we can do very successfully from a publishing standpoint. And to get there, you, you have to actually behave like a fiduciary, which we always have. We don't buy the stocks we write about. We put the customer first. They can always have their money back, X, Y, Z. And of course the products are pretty good. Um, and so to do that, the, the number one thing I thought we needed to do to get there was we needed to have a product that was similar to a Bloomberg terminal that would allow people to interface with us in a, in a more, in a, in a format that was more similar to other financial service providers, right? You don't interface with interactive brokers by getting something in your email. You interface by going onto a website or an app and using their services. So I wanted to create that and doing that was going to be expensive, especially, you know, um, all of the, all the technological backend stuff that we had to do to do that. So we have that problem. It is competitive, I think with, other similar things from Bloomberg and other people. Um, and then the other issue was that we found that we were pretty good at M&A. We were pretty good at buying companies, improving their products and processes and merging them. But to do that requires a lot of capital. So we were looking at one acquisition, which I'm not going to name because I know it's still in play, but, you know, and we needed probably $300 million to buy them. And you're like, whoa, that's a lot of money. Well, not really, not to a company that's doing 300 million a year in revenue, like we could afford it, but we couldn't find a bank to give us, to give us a loan because we weren't public. And you know, just all kinds of things that go along with that. You just cannot, you cannot do business at that scale um, unless, you're, unless you're public, unless you have audited financial statements, unless you've got CC stuff. So we just, it was just the next stage in our growth. You just, it's awfully hard to have a billion dollar a year in sales business that isn't public. Very difficult. I'm not saying it can't be done. It just, right. it's just very difficult. And then of course there was other factors. We have partners, some of whom wanted liquidity for estate planning and family planning right. reasons like, like Bill, who was much older than we are. And so there's a, you know, a raft of things. The other thing I always wanted, one last point is, you know, we would, we would make our customers promises like we don't buy the stocks we write about but how do they know we were really telling the truth right. and i if you say that in sec filing you better be telling the truth so we i thought that that transparency would help us and give us an advantage over our competitors as well fascinating okay um so now you're you like you said you, you retired from uh from market wise and you started you're starting something new um what are you doing well, it's called Porter and Company, and this is our offices here behind me. Um, I'm, I'm starting a, a much smaller company. I don't ever want to have more than maybe a dozen people. And I want to pursue, you know, just kind of a niche business where we have really great, highly specialized financial research products. And there's just a couple of spaces that having the right information makes an enormous difference in performance. And that's property and casualty insurance, which is one of these black box businesses that outside investors really can't understand mm -hmm. where we have really good longstanding connections and sources of information and biotech, which of course requires a whole lot of scientific knowledge. 
And those are really high margin products that don't require a lot of staff. They just require the right staff. Mm -hmm. Another example is distressed corporate bonds, a very niche product in finance, but one that's very, very lucrative. I think that if you look at our, our previous product called uh, credit opportunities, you find that, you know, annualized results are above 20% and, you know, 85% of those trades are wins. And that's really hard to do in finance if you're doing it for real. I don't, I don't mean the typical newsletter track record system. I mean, real dollar returns. So there's things that I just know how to do in finance that most people don't know how to do. And I don't think I need a company of 600 people to do them. And, you know, after 22 years, I was kind of worn out with managing 600 people and, and, um, managing the expectations of a lot of partners and, and having all that responsibility. So going forward, I just want to have a very small group that does a couple of things really well. And, uh, I'm not going to really be competitive with market wise. I'm still a major shareholder there. You know, none of my products will sell for less than a thousand dollars a year. So they're not going to be mainstream products. It's just going to be people who know me and know my, know my work who are, who are, you know, family office investors or, or brokers that with, with a big, you know, client base. I think that piece right there is, is something that people don't realize in the publishing space, which is that if you have the, the quality of product that you're talking about, um, it's not just the mom and pop retail investor who's buying them. It's, oh no, not at all. Yeah. And yeah, every, every hedge fund in the world reads my work. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think that's something that people don't think about that the business itself is there's a lot of different customer segments and publishing and media. And I think this is one of the, 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 this I've been preaching this for a while that one of the bigger trends in the industry as a whole is that uh, all areas of finance are really become, come, kind of coming on the table. All areas of investor are coming, are, are available as customers to the right types of businesses. Um, it's so funny. I can't tell you how many times I have seen my work plagiarized at conferences and almost always, almost always by people who are very critical of, of, of us. Yes. yes. Just terrible. Okay. It's like the Howard Stern thing. I'm sure you remember from, from uh, Howard Stern's movie, you know, this marketing manager came to him and said, Howard, we've got a big problem. You know, 75% of the people in New York radio market hate you. Oh, geez, that's terrible. Well, the good news is the people that hate you listen twice as long as the people who say, like <laughs> ah, yeah. I sure hate that Porter Stansberry guy. Where's his latest letter? Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Well, I appreciate you, uh, appreciate you taking the time today and, and talking with me about this stuff because I'm, I'm infinitely fascinated by kind of what you guys have done and the industry. And so and I think a lot of our people are too. And so we're really excited to have you join us at, um, for the Financial Marketing Summit in, I guess, it's a month and a half. Great. Yeah. And I want to, I want to, I want to pitch that if you don't mind just for once. Yeah. Second. Cause I would love there to. Are, uh, there, there are eight, there are eight, this is the copywriter in me, right? There are actually eight definitive steps that can lead your organization to lifetime values that are two or three times what they are now. And some of them are obvious that we discussed, but some of them aren't obvious. And, uh, I, I have a pretty good track record of doing that. And I will give you my actual playbook uh, at your conference. And I do appreciate being invited. And I do appreciate what you have done for our industry. I think that the more that we share best practices, the more credibility the industry as a whole can have. And of course, the more success people can have in, in the business. And, the, and that's just the thought that I would leave you with. I can't tell you how many times in my career, marketers and copywriters actually said to me, don't give me a really good idea because those don't sell. You know? <laughs> I, and that's, I, that's just not true that you just don't know how to sell them. Let me, let me show you. <laughs> and so uh, I just think that, that there's this, there has been in the past, this, this mindset that, you know, quote unquote, you know, good finance or complicated finance can't be sold to the public. And that just isn't true. I mean, me and Steve Sugarud, we had a, a, a package that was called portfolio repair. It came out in 2002, right after the bear market of 2001, 2002. And it was about mortgage REITs. Now, mortgage REITs are a real subset of finance. They're a real complex specialty. And you cannot explain to the average newsletter buyer what the hell a mortgage REIT is. But we didn't explain it that way. We explained it as government-backed portfolio repair, which it is. And so, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's learning how to do that stuff that I think can really make a big difference in your results. 
If you can start with good finance and then you take the time to put it in everyday language, you'll be way more successful than if you just make a bunch of empty promises and you don't have a very good financial product. Yeah. And just to kind of like put the cherry on top for everyone who's listening on the LTV conversation, the lifetime value conversation you're going to have at the summit, like what do those numbers look like just comparatively? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that when I left MarketWise in December of 2020, the average lifetime value, the average lifetime value of a converted customer. And what that means is someone who bought anything besides one thing. So we're not counting the people who, who came in and bought, you know, one $5 book and never bought anything else again. Not counting that. Calling anyone who bought more than, more than one thing from us. So you came in and you bought a $5 book and then you had a renewal or you bought another product or you, then that's a customer. So anyone who bought at least two things from us as a converted customer, and the average lifetime value when I left was $2,800. Um, I'm sure now it's well over 3,000. And that's on hundreds of thousands of customers. Yeah, that's on uh, approximately 400,000 people. So you can do that math. Yeah. And that's very high for, like I've seen like in a very niche, tiny like day trading spaces where you, they might have a higher customer value because you have essentially 20 customers you could get, but they're going to pay a lot. And to have a scaled business and have that kind of numbers, that's dramatically higher than anybody else I've seen in the space. Um, yeah. Dramatically higher. Yep. And I, I, we're not there yet, but I do believe that getting to a lifetime value of over $10,000 at scale, meaning, you know, at least a hundred thousand people is certainly possible with the right kind of financial uh, products. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's what I'm aiming to do at Porter and company. So we'll see if we'll see if it can be done. That sounds amazing. So again, thank you, Porter. I'm looking forward to seeing you in person uh, in uh, Orlando. And so um, I really appreciate you taking the time today. This was amazing for me and I think everyone else is going to really enjoy it. Well, I'll see you in June. All right. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.